Thank you very much. It's a real honor to be here today. I would like to talk to you about how big the challenge of climate change is, but how it's actually an enormous, enormous opportunity, and how technology can address it and allow us to make money and save the planet at the same time. The reason for this is that energy is the most important industry on Earth. It accounts for all of our comfort, convenience, livelihood, everything. This is a graph of the GDP per capita over the last 700 years. You can see it's pretty flat until it takes off at the Industrial Revolution, right when we discover how to harness cheap energy. Energy accounts for 10% of the entire $80 trillion global GDP. $8 trillion of the entire $80 trillion global GDP is energy. And we need cheap energy because cheap energy increases the GDP, increases the livelihood of the world. But our cost per unit of fossil fuel energy has been going up for the last 50 years. And price really matters. There's a dramatic increase in the market size of a given source of energy for every penny you reduce its price. It goes up by a trillion dollars. The market goes up a trillion dollars for every penny. That's how sensitive the world is to the price of energy. And people are not willing to pay more. These are pictures from just the last year of big protests that are going on around the world when governments increase the taxes on energy even just a little bit. People really do not want to pay more for their energy. And if you look at all of commodities, uh, cattle, coffee, sugar, and energy, all of them vary over time. The only thing that has gone down in price consistently for the last 50 years is the cost of computation. Computation is the only thing going down. So how can we use technology and computation to reduce energy costs? I think that's the answer. I'm going to answer that for you. I'm going to share with you my story of how I came to that realization, how my thinking evolved along the way, and show you some specific examples of putting that to use. My transformative event happened as a teenager. I was 15 years old. I grew up in Southern California. The oil crisis hit. There were long lines to buy rationed gasoline. My family could only buy $5 of gasoline per day on odd or even number days based on the last digit of our license plate. And my mother couldn't get enough gasoline to drive us to school. My brother and I had to ride our bikes five miles to school because we had no fuel. And I started thinking, there must be some other way we could use alternative energy. Remember, this is back in 1973. And I started thinking about all kinds of little solar things I could make, little parabolic concentrators out of tinfoil and then out of aluminum and glass. And I even made a little company when I was a teenager called Solar Devices selling kits and plans in the back of Popular Science magazine to try and get more knowledge about this alternative energy possibility. Then I went to Caltech in Pasadena. I started making loudspeakers. I graduated when the IBM PC came out. I started a software company that was acquired by Lotus. I started an educational software company that was acquired by Vivendi. And then I, I founded Idealab, one of the first technology incubators in 1996. In 1996, these were my first 12 ideas for companies to start under this new Idealab, sort of like a factory for companies a startup studio. And of those first 12 companies, five of them had IPOs. Five of them had successful IPOs. And that gave me the funding to continue Idealab to this day, 24 years later. And I started more than 150 companies across many areas, and especially back to my passion on renewable energy. Of those 150 companies, we helped them raise about $3.5 billion. We had 50 successful IPOs and acquisitions. We have 40 companies right now. But that means failures. So we had 60 companies that didn't succeed, and I learned a lot of lessons from those, and you're going to see how those apply to this energy challenge right now. My most valuable lessons learned across 24 years, 150 companies, these are the things, three things that I wish someone had told me before I started Idealab. The very first one, timing. You may be ridiculed for having an idea ahead of your time. In fact, you often will be. After you're ridiculed, it's often violently opposed once you start getting some traction. But finally, if you're successful, you get it as being accepted as self-evident. And when you get an idea through all three of those stages, that means you've truly changed the world, because you caused something to happen that wouldn't have happened otherwise. Well, many of our ideas were just way too early. I even gave a whole TED talk about timing and how important it is, but I really learned this lesson very, very painfully clear. Well, on this particular subject, climate change, the timing is perfect. The timing is right now. The world needs this right now. 2020, this turning point is one of the biggest turning points for all of civilization that we must jump on to solve this problem now. The second thing I learned, iterate. You never get it perfect out of the gate. All of the ideas we had, I always thought the idea was everything. In fact, I named it Idealab because I thought everything was with the idea. But 
product market fit, coming up with the thing that the market really needs and wants, that's not a little bit about that. It's all about that. So you win on iteration by being able to get the most learning per unit time, by being able to change the idea to adapt to what's necessary. And in fact, in hindsight, I realized I shouldn't have called it Idea Lab. I should have called it Iterate Lab. That would have been a better name for it. The third lesson, use Moore's Law. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. Exponential curves crush linear curves, linear lines. Uh, nothing has ever gone down as much in price or as fast as the cost of computing power. And the businesses that smartly harness that will win. And I have one example. This is Gord Gordon Moore coined this. He didn't call it Gord Moore's Law. He called it a trend back in 1965 when he first noticed this, that microprocessors were doubling, doubling the number of transistors every year. But take a look at this. This is a memory card in my hand that was hand wound with core memory, little iron cores. It's got 32 wires by 32 wires. So it's, it's 1,024 bits or 128 bytes. That was $1,000 back then. This was something that, that was put, say, in Apollo 11. And now take a look in my hand here. You won't be able to see it. It's the size of my pinky fingernail. Uh, it is 128 gigabytes for 995 at Amazon. So this has gone down 100 times in size, 100 times in price, <laughs> and a billion times more powerful. So you multiply those together, you get 10 trillion times more. What else has ever in history gone down 10 trillion times in 50 years? Well, you have to harness that, and we have to harness that for energy problem. I'm going to talk to you about how to do that. So I'm taking these three lessons I learned, timing, iterations, and Moore's Law, and trying to apply them to this climate challenge. And I think everybody should do this. Like, I'm going to give you three particular examples, but I think we need to do this a thousand times over. So first, most of you know this, but let me tell you some un unbelievable facts about the situation we're in. Each of us on Earth makes about one pound of trash every day. So seven and a half billion people put about seven and a half billion pounds of trash into landfills in the ground. But less well known is each one of us puts 31 pounds of CO2 trash up into the atmosphere. 31 pounds. It's pretty invisible. We don't see ourselves doing it, and that's why we don't notice. And that's 31 pounds for the average human on Earth. Those of us in this room, we're a little more well off, we travel, we have lighting, air conditioning, all these things. We probably put five or ten times as much as the average person. So each one of us, think about this, each one of us is putting our body weight of CO2 into the atmosphere every single day. It's staggering. That's why it's so big. And the volume of that body weight of CO2 is the volume of the entire ADNEC Convention Center. So imagine each one of us is putting the entire ADNEC Convention Center's volume worth of CO2 into the air every day for the lifestyle we have. That's why we have to make a change. That's why I, we have a challenge. We're using this thin sliver of the atmosphere as our new landfill for CO2, because we're putting it all up there. And of course, by putting it up there, we have all the catastrophic effects that you know, the storms and the weather changes and everything like that, and the fires. And in fact, half a billion animals died in just the last month in the fires in Australia. So we're actually making mag magnificently terrible impacts on the world with that CO2 we're putting up in the atmosphere. We're adding the heat to the Earth of the equivalent of three Hiroshima bombs every second. Again, if we could see this happening, we would stop it instantly. But because it's so invisible, we put it off. But we can't put it off any longer. So how do we do it? How can we use technology to, to, to change this? What are three things that we can do to change the world? I'm going to talk about three of them, but I'm going to first talk about energy storage. So all of you here know this, about the tremendous decline in the cost of wind power and solar power. You might not all know this, that in all of history, we reached a tipping point in 2017. 2017 was the first time that wind and solar, renewable energy produced from that source, was cheaper than fossil fuels. First time ever. Six cents, five cents, and now three cents and two cents for wind and solar. So basically, uh, I say it this way, renewables have won, but at the wrong time of day. Like if we could just solve the time of day thing, renewables have won, it's already over. So the last thing we need to solve is the time of day issue. Well, that means we need storage. The last hurdle is low-cost storage. Ironically and amazingly, it's more expensive to store energy than it is to make it. We can make the energy cheaply, but we can't hold on to it. We have to use it when we make it. So that's why we need storage so badly. And there's only three ways to store energy. This is just physics. Three major ways to store energy. Chemically with batteries of all kinds, thermally with hot or cold, and mechanically with gravity, compressed air, flywheels. We have to do all of them. But I took a tack to try and apply that Moore's Law idea to all of these, and I found an angle. And the particular angle was by looking at the cost of storing energy right now, 
Flywheels are 45 cents, flow batteries are 28 cents a kilowatt hour, lithium ion is 25 cents. The cheapest energy in the world, which accounts for, for storage, which accounts for something like 98% of all the energy we store on Earth, is pumped hydro. It's basically gravity storage, pumping water up a mountain, letting it flow back down to make the energy back when you need it. That's 17 cents. The tipping point that we need to get to is like three cents. Well, why is it three cents? It's because solar for two cents plus storage for three cents would get us to five, and that's the magical number we need to beat for all fossil fuels. It would be over if we can do that. So that, I think that's a huge important goal. Again, we need almost like a moonshot of activity to try and solve that. The particular uh, angle that we looked at was if pumped hydro is so good, how can we do that one better? How can we make that so we could put it anywhere without needing a mountain? And I first looked at building a big silo out of concrete and pumping water up that, but that was actually more expensive than pumped hydro because the cost of the concrete was so high. Then I looked at building a big mountain out of gravel, have a conveyor belt lift the gravel up and let it come back down and get the energy back that way. That was even worse still. Then I even looked at a big crane lifting up a big weight and then lowering the weight back down. Uh, that didn't work either. But uh, way expensive, 60 cents a kilowatt hour, and we need to get to three. But then the eureka moment came. This is a picture of my son and I in, in my shop at home with a little Amazon toy crane and some wood blocks. But the, the eureka moment was, what about if we use computer vision and software and AI to build an automatic crane that can stack blocks and unstack them? And that led to this, a special customized six-arm crane that can lift blocks and lower them and store energy for only three and a half cents a kilowatt hour. So very, very close to that magical three cents. And we'll be able to get there very, very soon. This company that we created around this is called Energy Vault. It's gravity storage. It's, it's, here, it's showing here at the show in the Swiss Pavilion. And it's seven times cheaper than batteries and five times cheaper than pumped hydro. So this is one angle that we can use to really, really make a dent. Basically, the tower is built up during the day or when the sun is shining and the wind is blowing, and then you lower the, the, the blocks back down to the ground. And these are 35-ton blocks, so big, heavy blocks. But they produce megawatts of power. Each one of these towers stores 35 megawatt hours, so it can make a big positive impact. And this is one way to make a difference in energy storage. It uses timing. It uses iteration. We tried lots of things before it worked. This one worked. And then Moore's Law, of course, because all the computation is required to make this run in an automated fashion. Now we get down to 3 and a half cents. I believe that over this decade, we need to drive this down to 1 or 2 cents. Everybody needs to drive it down with all the different methods I described. After announcing this just last year, there was a huge outpouring of demand. We have more than $10 billion pipeline of demand because people really, really want this to add to wind and solar to have baseline renewable energy. We're really, really excited to bring this to the world. We're building them as fast as we can. After announcing it last year, we were able to raise $120 million to scale this, and now we're building them all over. This is a, a picture of the progress of we're building one in Switzerland, but we want to build them everywhere, and especially here where the sun is so great, and we want to be able to make the energy on demand. Second idea. Solar process heat. Electricity is only one part of our fossil fuel carbon problem. We make three times as much CO2 in the atmosphere from heat. Not just ordinary heat like boiling water or heating our homes, but 20% of our global emissions come from high temperature heat, process heat that's used for making cement, making steel, making glass. All of the things that are in our built, in our built world come from a huge amount of energy. The energy to make this building was enormous, but that's all high temperature heat. I wanted to write and be able to attack that, and how could we bring Moore's Law to that problem as well? Well, current concentrated solar normally looks like this. Big mirrors that point to a central tower. They hit a big target, maybe 5 meters, 10 meters diameter, 200 meters tall. But the maximum temperature is 600 degrees C. So that's not high enough to make steel or glass or concrete. I wanted to come up with a way to use less materials, use less labor, use less calibration, but use more computation to make up for that, to make that much cheaper and much hotter. And I tried hundreds of ideas. This is over the last 20 years, trying every different idea to try and come up with a way to use that. But then finally, we came up with this angle. Single facet mirrors that are all computer controlled, but using computer vision to make their accuracy much, much greater. So the ease of putting them in the field is much, much higher. So we built a system like this. This is an aerial view of it. And up on the tower, there are high resolution cameras that look at all the mirrors simultaneously and automatically redirect them in real time at 30 frames a second using computer vision. Once again, Moore's Law to the rescue. This wouldn't have even been possible with enough computation power just five or 10 years ago. And now you can buy a $299 NVIDIA graphics card and you can do it trivially. So we built this system. This is what the cameras see. The cameras see this field of mirrors and automatically adjust every one of them in finite little movements to get them really precise. This company is called Heligen. It's also based in Pasadena, California. And you can see on the right, that's the sunlight 
reaching more than 1,000 degrees in that target. And the target is not five meters across and hundreds of meters tall. It's 18 inches diameter. It's the size of a basketball hoop. The mirror pointing is so precise, we can get all the rays in a very, very compact place so we can achieve arbitrarily high temperatures. And again, it was computation that enabled it. Here's an aerial view of what the field looks like with the computer-controlled mirrors. This is, the dream I have is to be able to lay these fields out square miles at a time, because now it doesn't need accurate surveying anymore. You could just drop these mirrors off from a truck because the software is going to automatically point them irrespective of if there's any shift of the ground or where they're placed. And that's, again, where computation allows us to do something you weren't able to do before. So now we use less materials, less labor, less calibration, because it's continuously calibrated. There is no calibration phase. And computation made a big, big difference. And now we can make heat for less than one cent a kilowatt hour. So two big breakthroughs that have happened just in the last few years. Electricity costs coming down below the fossil fuels, and now heat coming down below natural gas. From the very moment that we first made fire from a tree, we've never been able to make heat cheaper than by burning stuff. And now you can. Now you can concentrate the sunlight and make the heat actually for less money than for burning something. So that hopefully will be a very, very important thing for this coming decade. This opens up a whole bunch of opportunities. Of course, we can use this heat for desalination. We can use it for calcining cement. We can use it for steam methane reforming. We can use it for gasification. But very excitingly, we can use it to make hydrogen, because we can thermochemically split water with this high temperature. By making green hydrogen at these high temperatures, we can do something that was never before possible. We can take the sun and export it. This is something that I found unbelievable. If you take this much land in Saudi Arabia, only 4% of the land in Saudi Arabia, use that technology to make hydrogen, you could export the entire equivalent of all the oil exports of the country. And this is true of almost every country with sunshine. You can be a net energy exporter by using the sun to make green hydrogen. I think this is the future. We have to make this happen this decade. I think it can make a big difference. I'm really, really excited to share that with you today. And then finally, what's the last thing we need to do? Carbon capture and removal. We need to take CO2 out of the atmosphere. I told you I was a teenager growing up in Southern California. There was 315 parts per million in the air back then, going up two per, per year. Now we're at 417, going up seven per year. It's incredible how fast we're adding it. We have to go back in time. I would like to give my children and grandchildren the world I had as a teenager. Well, that's going to mean taking CO2 out of the atmosphere. It's very, very hard to do that, though. It's very hard to take CO2 back out, but we have to do it. The reason it's hard is to take one ton of CO2 out, we need to move a Colosseum's worth of air. You need to want, move 1.5 million cubic meters of air to get one ton of CO2 out. So you need a lot of fans and movement and filters to do that. And the existing attempts to do that are way too expensive. So I'm working on a new method, I'm just calling it carbon capture, which combines heliogen, the heat from heliogen, the storage from energy vault, and a new system that can pull CO2 out of the atmosphere cost-effectively, it effectively can do in one acre what a forest does in 100 acres. In one acre, we can take out one ton per day. Right now, it takes 100 acres of forest plus water to take out one ton per day. There isn't enough land to grow enough forest to take the CO2 out to go backwards, but there is enough land to be able to do it this way. So I'm very excited about doing that. A 390-mile square in the desert would take out all the CO2 of mankind. 338 gigatons a year that we put in the air, you could take it all out with this technology. So what's the bottle barrier? We just need to make it cheap enough. Again, Moore's Law to the rescue. I'm trying to figure out how to use more and more computation, drive down that cost, make this a reality. So in summary, energy storage, solar process heat, carbon capture removal. Each of the ideas, these ideas could be the biggest businesses of this coming decade. Each of them could be multi-trillion dollar businesses. I am so passionate about these ideas, I really, really want to make them happen. I'd love to find ways to work together with any of you here to try and bring these to the world and bring other ideas to the world if we can make that a possibility. We'd love to meet and work with you. My partner, Fatima, is here. Uh, my name is Bill. Uh, I'm Bill at IdealLab.com or Bill at Heliogen.com. We'll be in the Swiss booth at Energy Vault. We'd love to meet with you. Thank you very much. You've been a great audience.